uh, and it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Klaus Riseya. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, from uh, uh, who is the co-CEO of Blue Ocean Robotics Group. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here at the event to talk about my absolutely favorite topic, robotics. So very first, um, a little bit about my background. I've been active in robotics since 1988. So in many ways, I'm quite old guy. Um, for the first many years, I worked in industrial robots. That was until 2000. And then I've been working a lot on service robotics. Uh, I've both been an academics. I have been working in industry for many years. I have started up around 20 companies. I've been doing fundraising. Everything in robotics, so to speak. So 360 degrees around in robotics. And that was the background for starting up Blue Ocean Robotics. And Today, I have three things I would like to present to you. So the very first thing is about the robotics industry. And why is this industry growing so fast right now? It's the fastest growing industry on the planet. And why is this so? I will show you why. And I will also make some predictions about where we're heading in the next five to 10 years. Second, I will show you some of the robots that we are building in Blue Ocean Robotics, 12, 10, 12 of these robots, so you get an idea about <laughs> what are we talking about when we talk about robots. I will also share with you the business model that we have, and it's a well-proven business model for this early stage industry. And third, I would like to share with you a lot of robots that already exist out there but many people do not actually know that these robots are already there. So I hope that this can be an inspiration for you, and I hope that it will motivate some of you for working with us, Blue Ocean Robotics or others. And I think I have some special surprise also regarding what is happening in robotics in Lithuania today. So let's start by looking at the robotics industry. This industry is growing rapidly, exponentially, in fact. It has been doing so for some years. Why is that? It has to do with the computational power. You know that um, computational power at a given price is growing exponentially. For $1,000, you can buy a computer chip today uh, which has the power of a big insect or a mouse. So it means that the robots that we built have a power of processing data from the world at that level. But if you look ahead on the trajectory that we're following, in 2023, it has the computational power of a human brain. Think about it. The robots will change dramatically. They will go from being not that smart and not knowing very well how to understand the world to being really smart to really understand how you think, how you behave, why you behave in this way, just like a human does. In, in 2037, you can buy 10,000 computer chips with the power of a human brain, or it costs one, uh, one cent, dollar cent. And if you project even further, 49, you can buy one computer chip at $1,000 with the computational power of the whole human race on Earth. And 10 years after, it cost one cent. So the predictions of this is that robots become really smart. And this is why we see robots coming from a cage, uh, being fenced, and they were, uh, they were a threat to people if they hit them. Now they got out of the cage. They can move around with people. Right now, they're not so smart, but they can, they can still see you. They can understand to avoid colliding with people. They can interact, but they're not that smart. But over the next five, seven years, it will change dramatically. I promise you. Um, so I brought here. Uh, an example of so one of the consequences that's on the sensor side. We will move into very smart sensors. So for example, you see the guy with the face, and here there's a simple sensor just watching his face, and 
um, actually finding out if he's angry or happy or joyful. And so it's this kind of detecting what people, the, their mindset, also tracking their gesture, uh, what they do with their body and their eyes, what are they looking at. And all of that is necessary for the robot to process. So the AI part is also uh, progressing uh, very fast. And AI here for us in robotics means the robot's uh, ability to perceive the world, uh, think about alternative plans, uh, think about the consequencing of executing plans, and deciding which plans are the best to execute. So it's really the brain power uh, that comes with it. Another way robots will change over these years is that robots will more and more go out into the world and experiment. They will listen, they will watch, they will talk to people, they will even ask other robots. And based on that, they learn things. So this is also, we see the change, we already see this happening now, robots that learn from their experience. This is something new, it's four or five years old, but it has really uh, improved a lot in the last years. And last, the last thing which is going to change a lot is that when, when humans learn things, I mean, if one of you want to teach me something, you will start by explaining it to me, you will show it to me, then I will try and do it, then you correct me, I'll try again. So it's actually a very long process. It takes a long time. Robots, that's different. Let's say I'm a cooking robot in a private home somewhere, and my owner, he taught me how to make an omelet for the breakfast. Once I've learned it, I upload it to the World Wide Web for robots. And this is not something futuristic, this already exists. So I upload that task, that job, to the World Wide Web for robots. Now, in another home, in your home, you buy a robot that can help you, in the kitchen, for example, and you say, can you make me an omelet? That robot goes to the net, finds out that this Klaus Rieseger robot has actually also already done this, has learned this already, and downloads this information, translates it into a different body, and can do the omelet right away. So it takes like a millisecond for one robot to learn another robot what to do. So you can also think about this as a kind of, with, we see the robots physically as one robot and another robot and another robot, but in a certain way you can think about it differently. You could say all these robots are like one brain, but many physical expressions. They share brain, they can share brain. One robot can ask another robot to, robot to go and do experiments, learn things and come back and they can share. So this is gonna revolutionize the world as we know it. So to summarize a little bit, computational power is driving this industry forward. Uh, it's, <coughs> sorry, it's uh, advanced sensors, it's AI, it's the learning from experimenting in the world and it's sharing over the cloud. Those are the factors that are going to change this industry a lot. And let's take a look at uh, how the industry is actually looking and how it's predicted. So you can see these numbers. This is the fastest growing industry in the world. Uh, so you can see it's almost tripling in 10 years. That's the total industry. If you go further down, for example, on personal robots, service robots, you can see it's even much more. We're going from uh, almost no robots to thousands and thousands and thousands of robots. And actually, the industry is very young. I mean, maybe there are two or 3,000 people out there in the whole world that are actively building robots. That's it. So it's a tiny little industry. And if you want to make a business, if you want to work with this, you should better join now. It's a really good timing, really good timing. I promise you. Um, even if you look at the most mature industry, which is the manufacturing area. It has been around since the 70s. This industry is still growing a lot. You can see the curves here. And even if you dig into the manufacturing in the industry, you'll see that the automotive industry, car manufacturers, are actually driving the whole industry. So you see the, the peaks. Um, so you see the peaks up here? That's automotive. But if you go to food industry, plastics industry, 
um, uh, furniture production and so on, you see no robots. There are no robots. So in a certain way, you don't even see the tip of the iceberg. It's not even come to the surface yet. So that it's just going to be a huge industry coming up. This is, uh, this is the curve for mobile robots, you know, driving around. I will show you later what a mobile robot is. This is the curve, sales curve, for the biggest robot company in the world. It's American. It's in Silicon Valley. It's called Intuitive Surgical. They have one product, a robot for surgery. That's it. So you see they, in, in these six years, they increased sales with 600%. One robot costs $2 million. So think about it. 3,500 people, 4,000 people, something like that. And we can build hundreds of robots like that. So it's just about getting started with that, and we can build huge industries in this area. Many people have actually predicted that this is a promising industry. Bill Gates, uh, you know he was right before. Um, he came up with this vision, there will be a robot in every home. It's not there yet, but I think we're getting close with um, lawn mowers and vacuum cleaners and so on. Also, the United Nations Economic Chamber of Commerce, they um, made a study, and their conclusion was that in this century, the robotics industry will have a bigger impact than automotive did in the last century. Think about it. Roads, cars, trucks, all of that is smaller than what the robots will, will have an impact on in this century. And they studied this very carefully. Uh, and I have to mention one thing, and this is the last thing about the, the industry. A lot of people are afraid of robots in the sense that they're taking away jobs. And this is something I just want to spend one minute on, because um, all studies show that when you introduce technology, people become more productive, and it actually creates more jobs. One of the proofs is that there are more technologies out there today than ever, and there are more jobs out there than ever before. But the challenge for the societies and people, individual people, is that the jobs that are available, they change you go to a higher and higher level of competence and skill. So it's a problem if, you do, if you're not educated or if you don't want to sort of follow the technological trend. And a lot of new jobs are created, jobs that we don't even know today. For, I took some statistics from a uh, European Commission. Today, four million people are working in the app industry. This is something that didn't exist in 2007. There were no one working with apps in 2007. One million, four million people work with this. This is one percentage of Europe's population that work with something related to apps. That's crazy. That's, that's really crazy. And the prediction is that in three years' time, it's eight million. So it's actually a lot of jobs are created based on technology. But if you're not into apps, if you're not working with apps, you don't get a job, of course. So you have to follow the technological trend. That's, an, that's a recommendation. Okay. So that was sort of the, the, the reason why the robotics industry is growing so fast now, and also uh, where are we heading uh, on, the, on the overall numbers. Let me give you first an overview now about Blue Ocean Robotics, what we're doing, some of the robots we're building, and I will share with you our business model. I hope it can be an inspiration for those of you who want to get into the industry. And yeah, so ba the, the, the basic for Blue Ocean Robotics is that we create new robots, and we commercialize them. Create means build them, make the new ones. And commercialize means get them into the market, prove with the customers that they work, and make the business grow big based on that. So a little bit of history and status is that we were three founders of the company uh, three years ago. Um, today, we are 45 people in the headquarter in Denmark. We are 100 people globally. We have 18 companies that have started up inside the Blue Ocean Robotics Group. Um, we are based in Lithuania, which was, by the way, the first place outside of Denmark, but I'll come back to that. We're in Norway, we're in Sweden, we're in Germany, we're in the Netherlands, we're in Australia, United States, uh, Hong Kong, and we're starting up now in uh, Malaysia, Thailand, 
uh, Singapore, Italy. So it's growing crazy. And you can see some names also, Scape Technologies, Nanorec, Walmart, and so on. These are spin-off companies, and I will explain to you later what that is. So here in Lithuania, uh, Justinas and Thomas are the co-owners and our CEOs uh, running the operation here. And well, many people asked us, why on earth are you starting up in Lithuania? What's special about Lithuania? And there are actually several things. Um, well, of course, there's the personal relationship, which matters a lot. Thomas, Justinas, uh, and John Una and I, we know each other. That's, that's an important thing in a partnership-based uh, company. But next to that, we felt that we could see that in Lithuania, there's a really strong uh, base of talent in software development. Also in building sensors, like lasers and so on. Also in mechanical things. And there's an interest and there's a willingness to actually engage in this. So here in Lithuania, we're very active. We're more active on creating robots rather than just commercializing. So we're doing a lot of R&D. We're building robots. Uh, we are teaming up with good partners. We're always on the lookout for good partners here. Building these robots, make the first series production, all of these kind of things. And then through the Blue Ocean Robotics Group, simply uh, get the sales up and running internationally. So that's sort of the, the, the main thing here. You can see that we've already reached like 10 people, and we have a number of people associated at, uh, on the top of that, and several projects. And then I think we have a, we have a special announcement today. So we have try, been trying not just to start up Blue Ocean Robotics here, but actually trying to get a bigger community up and running in robotics. So I'm very happy to announce that today we're starting the Lithuanian Robotics Association. So, yeah. And Thomas is the chairman. And um, Edgaras Ligteris, I hope I pronounce it right. He's the CEO, he's the former director of Knowledge Economy Forum. So every one of you who would like to work in robotics or find out how you can get started or co contact them and get started. I, I think this is a really good thing uh, and I believe Lithuania has a great future in this area. And it's, um, I know in Lithuania there's been a lot of talking about that Lithuania was just a place where you can have cheap production, but we're actually doing it differently. We are actually building robots here now and exporting these robots. So we're creating our own robots with an IP on the robot. So I think there's a new chance for Lithuania here to kickstart some new business, a new branch of industry. So yeah, so that's the Lithuanian motivation part here. Okay, so Blue Ocean Robotics. Let me show you a little bit some of the robots we have. Um, so we have uh, teamed up with a company called Deco. Deco is a company that have uh, 200 people. They are putting up heavy glass plates when you make new office buildings and you make these uh, meeting rooms and offices and you place these uh, plates there. They're very heavy, like 70, 80, up to 120 kilogram. Two or three guys are lifting on this, uh, moving them around, and when they reach my age, uh, a little bit more than 40, they start asking for retirement. They're really sick of the work. So they need a robot that could be collaborative. One guy to work with the robot. The robot should be able to pick up the glass, move around with it, get through narrow corridors, take up all the weight, assist when you're doing the mounting of the glass, and so on. So we teamed up with Deco and designed and developed that robot. That is a part of the development, and also the first series production is taking place here in Vilnius. So I'm very proud of that. And based on that, we have spun out a company called Walmo, called the Wall Mounting Robot. So Walmo. So that's one type of robot that we've built. Uh, another type is, um, you know, when you go to a hospital, there is some risk that you get an infection there. And actually, many people die of that. It's pretty serious to get an infection when you get to a hospital. Uh, 3,000 people die in Denmark every year because of this. So this is what you see here in the video, is the way you clean these hospital rooms. But what you need to do is take out the bacteria. So for that, we have made a UV light-based robot. There are already uh, UV light systems where you, it's a wagon, you move it around, 
but you don't effectively kill the bacteria because you have shadow effects on the walls. So we made a robot. It knows the surfaces of the room, and it moves in a structured way so that you can control how many bacteria you kill. This is made again, and we have a process. We call it um, uh, Roby design, robot business design. So this is a unique, unique method we use. We work with end users, strategic end users that are willing to co-invest, co-design, bring in their people, help on everything. So here it's, uh, it's 10 Danish hospitals that participate in this development. Um, yeah, so that's another example. And this is a problem that the whole world has. It's everywhere. Every country in the world has this problem with hospital infections. Here, I cannot show you the robot because it's very, very um, under development and it's confidential. But another hospital case, you know how difficult it can be to get patients out of the bed, into the bathroom, get the clothes off, and stuff like that. So normally, people are lifting around on, on patients. Um, so the staff is lifting around on patients. So we had a hospital coming to us and said, uh, OK, we've seen these images here from Japanese uh, producers. And then we had to correct them and say, these are research labs. You cannot, you cannot move patients around in that way. So we joined again in this Roby design with them and have designed now what we call a multi-tower which is basically a robot that can move into the patient room. The patient can call the robot themselves. They can themselves get up in the robot. They can get out to the toilet. It's perfectly private. Um, yeah, so the first hospital has ordered 120 units. So that's great. But uh, we're still one year from actually having the robot. So that's good. It's an early industry. You can sell 120 robots, but you don't, you don't have it yet. That's, so get into this business, everyone. Um, just showing the variety of what we have. Uh, here we have a drone and a subsea uh, robot. They work together. The problem here is that big fishermen, they have these big nets when they catch the fish. If you have mackerel and herring in a mixture, for example, you get two kroner per kilogram, two Danish kroner per kilogram. And if you close the net more than a certain amount, the fish will die, and they have to take it up. But if you can catch only mackerel alone, you get 12 kroner per kilogram. And, and you have 1,400 ton of fish in every net. So that's a lot of money, and also uh, quality for people, because if you mix them, it ends up, end up as uh, dog food and stuff like that. But if you can have mackerel by itself and herring by itself and so on, it becomes human food. So it's much more valuable in that way. So we build these drone systems for these uh, fishermen. Another type of drone system, when you spill oil and you contaminate it in a, this uh, surface ring, then you want to, to burn it off. But it's actually very difficult to burn oil when it's in the water. Normally, it's like a very risky business. They go out in a small boat. They have a kind of Molotov cocktail, and they try to get everything on fire pretty dangerous. So we made a drone instead that can fly out and actually throw a, a firebomb. So it's both fun and safe. And um, this is a case from Blue Ocean Robotics in Germany. Here we're building a very, very small, lightweight robot arm, safe, can do simple operations, moving, assembly, pick and place, things like that, all kind of things. Um, it's it's close to being ready for the market. There are lots of applications for this. Um, this is made here in Lithuania. So you know that in metal production industries, you have these bending machines. So you put a metal plate inside, and the bending machine goes down, and you bend a piece of metal. And you do that over and over again. Normally, you have someone standing there until he gets his finger squeezed off. Um, so we've made this robot uh, so that you put all the parts to the robot, and the robot is feeding the machine and taking the parts out again. So, and it's, um, it can fit with all the kind of bending machines that are around. 1.5 million bending machines are around. So it's actually a, a very great case. It's, all, it's also under development, but I think some months from being ready. Um, Huti is, I think, the very latest development here in Lithuania. 
So Hootie is actually a fleet of robots which do not look like robots. So you know when you get to the airport, you get into these rows. And if you have a lot of traffic in the airport, you need to control that traffic very well. Otherwise, you get a lot of queues, you get people that are frustrated and stuff like that. So we have built this system where the, the robots can coordinate their positioning so that they optimize on the flow and the use of the different kiosks that you have. So it's under development. Uh, this is in the windmill uh, area, so very big metal parts, uh, pr uh, positioning with high precision, and doing the machining of these parts with high precision, 0.1 millimeter positioning. Here we've made a system for that. This is from Sweden. You know, you move hospital beds. After the patients leave, you move hospital beds down to the basement. You wash it. You move it back again. So in, in an ordinary hospital in Sweden, you have like 18, 20 people doing that. And they want to do something else. Uh, so we're making a robot that can actually get the bed to the basement and get it back again. Um, here, uh, Laptics is a laparoscopy surgery robot. So today, when you do a laparoscopy surgery, you have two doctors. One is doing the surgery, using both hands with the instruments, and one doctor is holding a camera. So the doctor who's doing the surgery is telling the other guy, uh, move the camera out a little bit, uh, turn right, uh, zoom in, and so on. So actually, it's a waste. And that doctor, number two doctor, he hates his job because he's just standing there for two hours to do the sur surgery. And also, if you videotape the, the whole surgery process, you can see that like one third of the time is spent on giving a command, waiting for the guy to respond with the camera. So what we've done is that the doctor can now, we've made a robot that holds the camera. And then the doctor, through eye movement and, and voice command, can actually control the movement of the robot. So the, the number two doctor can now become number one doctor in another surgical room. He's happy. The other thing is that you can speed up the surgery. So it takes like two thirds of the time it took before. So very good. This is under development also. Heart scanning robots, you know, in rural areas um, where, it, where it's very difficult to get an expert doctor out to do a heart scan or a scan of a knee, or if you have a pregnant lady, you need experts to do those kind of scannings. But with this robot, you can do it remotely. So someone in Vilnius can do a heart scan or a scan of a knee or anything anywhere in Lithuania. Just have the robot there. Uh, floor washing, a huge area. There's, there are existing products like the red one, which is a very big one, and a small one from iRobot for private homes. We're making something in the middle for office areas like that. So I think this is, um, this is just a range of examples of some of the robots that we are building ourselves. Um, but we could continue for a long time. We have 15 robots that we're actually building right, right now. And then we have around 30 robots that have been built by others. And I will explain to you in our business model why we're, try why we're working on commercializing robots that others have built. So you see here um, a, a set of uh, some of the robots that we're working with. So let me share with you our business model. I hope it's an inspiration for you. And if you have questions to it, come and ask me. It's a business model which is optimized to this early stage industry. And in a certain way, I think it's generic. I don't think it would only work for robotics. I think it would work for other areas as well, as long as it's kind of the blue ocean, or I think we name it the virgin ocean also today. Um, but there are a few concepts I would like to share with you. A joint venture in this case is kind of a franchise. You have a, like Blue Ocean Robotics Denmark creating, commercializing robots. We do the same in Lithuania. We do the same in Germany, and so on. So these are similar companies in a group working like one company. That's what we mean by joint venture. A spin-off is when we build a robot, bring it to the market, successfully make it work there, and then we spin it off into a separate company. We use these rockets as symbols, because the philosophy or the mission for them is really to get up high in the air, get big, grow big. And then sales partner is very ordinary, like including sales partners for, for doing sales. So let me explain 
this is the most busy slide I have out of, of all of them. So point number three and point number four are the most important things for us. Point number three is build robots together with end users, create these robots. Number four is once we have matured these robots, built them, brought them in the market, spin them off into separate companies. And then point number one is the selling of robots or commercializing these robots. Here, of course, we are selling, commercializing our own robots, but we're also including third-party robots. And this has been the big question mark for many, because why are we doing that? Well, first, we, we earn money. That's good. It can finance the development. But what is more important is actually that we get to know the customers. We know their needs. We know their problems. We also know what existing robots can do and not do. So we, we now discover all the gaps in the market. And we can also find those end users who are willing, who are willing to become strategic end users and invest in um, developing new robots. Once we have matured the development of robots or the sales to a certain point, we start including um, sales partners. So this, these are the first four core elements in the business model. And this is something every Blue Ocean Robotics company is doing. And then number five is simply to have Blue Ocean Robotics in many, many countries so that we can work together as a group. Because robotics is a global thing. It's very difficult to make one company that can do any, everything in robotics because it's so many technological areas like software, uh, elect uh, ele electrical things, um, electronics, sensors, uh, mechanics. Uh, and then you need to know the application area. You have the human-robot interaction uh, or the interfaces. So there's a lot of things you need to do. So you need to be a group before you really perform well. So these are the five components. Uh, another way to show it is, Let's say we start in this way. We have the robots from the third-party vendors. We sell them directly to the customers. Once we have matured this, we include sales partners. Based on what we learn with the customers, we start up development of our own robots. Once we have matured that, we make these rocket spin-offs. And then finally, we have these joint ventures. So, in some sense, it's a bit complicated. Five components in the business model. But on the other hand, it's perfectly fit for a very early market because you can exploit all the opportunities that you find. And it's very robust. If you go in some one area, hospital robot for, for a particular application, and it does not work or the timing is different than what you thought, you're not so vulnerable because you can have other robots that are working better. So it's a very robust uh, business model. And this is also why I can say that we have never had a bank loan. We have never had an investor on board inside Blue Ocean Robotics. We simply started up and started selling these robots and running this business model. And we've been growing from three people to 100 people in three years. And we have profit every year. That's actually very nice. OK, so and if you know this curve of um, value of death or the chasm, you can see that we've concentrated around this, the value of death, and the methodologies are focused on that. Okay. Um, so free owners of the, the holding, and these, this is the complex of the 18 companies. Before the end of the year, there will be around 30 companies in, yeah. So I will sw switch to another PowerPoint, just one second, and show you a lot of the robots that exist in the market. OK. So let me start by telepresence. Uh, all of you know Skype. So telepresence or telemedicine or telecare robots, it's very simple. Um, it's like Skype. You, you use your computer or a tablet. You connect just to a robot on the other end. And through your screen, you can move with the robot. So you, sh you saw that lady. Through the computer, she connects to this robot. She can join a meeting. She can go to the production side. She can visit people. So it's like Skype on wheels. And you can do a lot of things. We have uh, implemented this in uh, hospitals, manufacturing companies, offices, at big events, trade shows. There's no limitation on this. 
Uh, th this example is simply a, a boy, he's sick, he cannot go to school because of some infection, but he goes to school now through the robot. Perfect, very good. And, and by the way, what we see now is just the first generation. You can only move, you can only communicate. <coughs> Sorry. But we, the next generation will actually be more intelligent so that the camera can be used for actually observing things and reporting back to you. There will also be put autonomy on the robot so it can move around. So you can say, go to the classroom. The robot will go to the classroom. When it gets there, it calls you back and says, I'm there. So these kind of things, and also a small arm will come at some point. So this is, this is under uh, a lot of development. So uh, transportation robots, sorry. Yeah. Uh, transportation robots um, are really out there now, and the sales numbers increase significantly. So this is a proven technology. You make a map over the uh, building, you put it into the robot, and then you say where you want to go from and to. And you can go like taxi. You, you call it an ad hoc transport. It can go like a bus or a route. You can do whatever you want in that way. Uh, it can drive the elevator, and it's actually perfect for that. It's faster than a human because it calls the elevator when it's on its way. So when it gets to the elevator, it's already there, and it goes in, so it can drive in that way. It's very work efficient. Like in one of the hospitals where we implemented such a robot, um, the robot had an average of 12 minutes of delivery of blood samples to their lab. And the staff was laughing at the robot when we installed it because it's moving pretty slowly, very steadily, in order to be safe. But after we saw the statistics from the staff, which was uh, like 17 minutes or so, they realized that a lot of time, uh, I mean, humans spent their time very bad they go to the toilet, they talk to colleagues about football in the weekend, and they're not very productive when they're doing uh, boring jobs. So the robot is actually much more efficient, even though it looks very slow and so. But th there are many systems like this. Um, here, a little bit more on the edge of the technology, up to the, you see the budgie, which is a robot where you have a tag, you put it in your pocket, and then you go shopping, and it follows you. So you can have 25 kilograms of food in it, or whatever you want. Um, and to the other one, where you see the guy is taking out a bottle, bottle of water, that's for hotel services. So you say, I need some water, I need a newspaper. Um, and it brings it to your door. When you open the door, it opens. Uh, the, the robot opens, and you can get out the stuff. And you can see on the, uh, in the bottom, you can see two types of systems where you're in a storage area. You don't move around to get the stuff. The stuff gets to you, and you package or you do assembly. So these systems are now um, existing and being implemented around the world. Uh, drones for logistic is also an area which I'm sure you have heard of. Drones are very famous, uh, both for good and bad reasons. But Amazon has invested a lot in now finding out how can they do transportation with drones. Um, there are other, just to show you how, how well you can actually control these robots. You can serve drinks if you want. You can, and like the lady in the bottom, you can see if there's a heart attack, you can get these drones to move very fast, get out with, yeah, you can see that, get out with equipment for, for assisting and so on. There's no end to which applications you can use drones for. There's so many applications. I've seen a list of more than 80 different applications. So it's just to start off. But of course, the market is very quickly getting overflowed. There's a lot of players in, in the drone market now. Um, of, of course, you have heard about the self-driving cars. Maybe you're not aware that the European Commission is now making the legal, all the law stuff for 2020. That's in four years. In four years from now, robot cars or self-driving cars will be legal. So on the highway, maybe in the city somewhere, you will be allowed to drive with your self-driving car. It will change our society completely. You know how owning a car was very normal 15 years ago? Now leasing is more what people think about getting a car. Leasing it, it's simpler. 
you don't need to own it. With this technology, you don't even want to lease it. You just want your, an app and said, I need a car. Or if you have a car, you, um, you make sure your car is used by others also. So when you get to work, you tell the car that it can do taxi driving until 4 o'clock when you go home. So there will be, the need for cars will be much, much smaller. And they are way more safe than any human can ever be. It reacts at least four times faster than any human on Earth can ever do. Our nervous system is simply too slow. So when our grandchildren will hear about that we were actually driving the cars ourselves, they will say to you, what a crazy world. So you were hitting the other guys just like that. How it's amazing that you were allowed to do that. No insurance company will ever allow you to drive your own car in a few years from now, ever. They, it will be insanely expensive because you can actually hit other people with it. Uh, trucks, that's just around the corner. It's very obvious. They drive very long trips. Uh, it's very boring for them. So, obviously. Um, uh, and uh, the latest thing I saw is uh, drones for person transportation. I just want to show you this is also coming. So you get in. They get a little bit scared when they press the button, but um, up they go. And yeah, this is the scary part. But this is also coming. Drones for transportation. It's not a stunt video. It's real. Uh, cleaning, all kind of cleaning, personal uh, hygiene, uh, washing your hair, uh, lawn mowing, um, all kind of things can be done with robots today. All of these exist. They are all in the market. Maybe it's an early stage, but they're all here. Uh, people with disabilities, like uh, you see the young guy in the bottom, he cannot eat by himself, so he uses a robot. Uh, to assist him in eating. Um, either the robot can uh, help him not to shake too much, or, his, or the robot is simply doing all the job. Or you see the other robot, which is attached to a wheelchair. With this, you can actually do physical things like shaving, taking water out of the um, refrigerator, and stuff like that. These exist. These are being used only in small numbers, but it's growing. Um, in rehabilitation, this is a fusion of gaming, robotics, um, and physiotherapy, of therapy, uh, neuro uh, rehabilitation therapy. So here you, in the beginning, when you have a, uh, let's say a stroke, uh, the robot is actually taking you through certain movements and you're restoring in your brain the functionality, the capability to move. Later on, the robot is just supporting you and later on again, it's actually giving some resistance, so you're act actively training. But there are a lot of these systems you see for all kind of um, problems or, or disabilities that you have. Uh, that you have. Uh, exoskeletons. Uh, these technologies are um, body suits you put on your body. So let's say you're in a wheelchair, you have a, a muscular disease, your brain system works, but when the nerve signal gets to the muscles, you don't react. So the robot is actually detecting the nervous signal and understands, OK, now you want to move, so then you move. A more simple system is that you use crutches, and you can move your center of mass, mass uh, forward, and then the robot starts moving. So these are very mechanical and pretty heavy, although the robot holds the weight itself. There are also a new generation coming up, which are these uh, soft exoskeleton. These are more like fabrics. And inside the fabrics, you have some very thin wires and a battery pack on the back. So it means that, um, that the, 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 the suit you have can actually move your body or assist in moving your body, depending on how much assistance you need. This is also coming. These are already here, the, the ones you saw before, the mechanical ones. This is under research. Cyborgs, I've, made, I've taken with me here three examples. The guy in the top, he has an artificial hand. 
it's attached to some of the muscle parts he has in his elbow. So by training on how to use that, he can actually uh, learn how to use the robot hand. Uh, that also counts for the guy in the lower left part. The guy in the lower right part is actually, oh, for you it's the opposite, so it's the lower left part. So the guy there, he's completely paralyzed. So he got a chip inside his brain, and he's, and he's training now how to actually think in the right way so the chip will understand this as movement, and then that is given over to a, an arm so that he can actually do manipulation. Yeah, he's saying hi to his girlfriend there. This is also here right now. So robots for therapy, like for people with dementia, children with ADHD, uh, there are seals and cats and this tilinoid, this uh, naked uh, type of Japanese robot. They are already here, they're being used right now. This is very a topic we don't talk about, but this is a fast growing industry. Robots that for lonely people, for love and sex and marriage, some says. I don't know, but we'll see. One guy in the United States claims he has married his robot already, so, but that's the United States. Um, what about this guy? It's being released this year. It's a robot you put on your desk at home, and it's for talking. It's for entertainment and remembering things and socializing and uh, remember to pick up your kids in half an hour and uh, can I do anything for you? And uh, by the way, the grocery have an offer this afternoon. Should I order some food for you already? Jibo is the name. You can buy it from the web shop. Autism robots. So training social skills for children with autism, very hard to do for teachers. But with a robot as the medium to do that, we've seen very, very significant results on that. A different type of robots here, like a ball. These children learn now to play and interact, which is normally what they find very, very difficult. Um, this guy is called Romebo. It can teach languages. It can speak 26 languages. So in Asia, a lot of kids are learning English with this robot, because they say it's much better than the teachers they have in English. So, and it's fun, they love it, they hug it, they want to bring it home, it's great. So, and maybe one of the last things is uh, collaborative robots is now a big, big issue. So instead of making autonomous robots in industry, industry is now focusing much more on collaborative robots. That means think about them as assistants. You teach them what they do, you show them how to work, and they will learn, and you correct them. So they assist you in these kind of, and, and the robots I'm showing here are on the market. This is not research. These are ma robots, you can buy them today. This is um, Baxter. Our own glass mounting robot, um, same. It's a collaborative robot. So the last thing I wanted to say, the very last thing here I wanted to say is that there's a new trend that you can also think, take a look at all the robotic stuff, and then if you have some other products, you could actually take the trend from robotics and transform the products you have into a new generation of products. And I've brought with me three examples of products that are not really robots, but they have been completely transformed by using robot technology. And here I will not talk, I will just um, start them, and you can think for yourself. The first one, is a wake-up alarm. I think it's perfect if you have a teenage daughter or a teenage son and they can't get up in the morning. Let's see. Wake up, baby head. 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 Wake up, baby head.
Don't, don't start it again, yeah. So you can buy it on the net, it's $40. And you can voice, you put in your own voice, first some nice music and then get up. You can really do things there. The other one is a stroller. Let's take a look at that one. You get the idea. And the last one is a new kind of loudspeaker, a physical one that can actually interact with the music. So let's see that one. So it plays your music. Yeah, so who wouldn't, wouldn't want this guy in your kitchen, right? Thank you so much.